Hello everyone and welcome back to the Professional Diploma in Photography here with Shaw Academy. Well done on making it to lesson number 8 in module 1, the final lesson of this module. A very, very exciting lesson that we have lined up for you. We're finally going to take full control and look at fully manual mode. But before we get into that, um, did you know that the most expensive camera ever sold was the Leica Zero series camera? And this was sold at the West Licht Photographica auction, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, in Vienna for 2.16 million um, euro. Only 25 of them were ever made. And it's really down to how many cameras are produced that will kind of push up their uh, price in terms of um, if you're thinking of selling one on and, uh, you know, if you're wondering how rare, you know, any old cameras you might have lying around are. And the reality is the majority of cameras that were produced in the 20th century are not really that rare. Um, you know, there's certainly loads and loads of them still out there if you know where to look. But there are a few exceptions. And of course, the Leica Zero series is one of them. And is currently the most expensive camera that was ever sold. So an interesting fact to get us started for this lesson. You're here with myself, William Eames. Big thank you to all of you for sticking with me throughout this course and making it all the way to lesson number eight. And, you know, as I always, always say, is the key to success is to show up on every lesson. For those of you who have made it this far, you are the ones that are going to be successful with your photography. You are the ones that are going to go out there and take photographs that you're going to be really happy to show other people and just ones that you're really, really happy to take yourself. And you're going to start looking at the world in a completely completely new way and certainly after this lesson you know photography is just going to be ingrained into your brains into your minds and you're going to be constantly thinking about how to compose the shot and how to get the right exposure for any situation that you find yourself in so of course as well if you have any questions in this lesson and any lesson, do ask more if you start chat with the classroom as well and keep rating those responses and reach out to us at support at academy.com if you've got any outstanding questions. So lesson number eight, fully manual mode. The key lesson on this course, because it's now time to put all of those skills together that we have been looking at throughout the course. So we can start taking everything that we know about our cameras, about our lenses, about composition, about our shutter speeds, about our apertures, about the light meter that we had a look at in the last lesson and putting it all together so we can create our own fully manual exposures, meaning we have total control over every aspect of our photography. And that's what mastering manual mode is all about. It's being able to make these creative and technical decisions to get these much more advanced and stunning photographs. Like in this photograph here, you know, we've got this tremendous use of depth of field and a uh, very, very high quality focusing here as well. And, um, you know, to get this very tricky photograph of this owl. But Mastering fully manual mode means that we can make these creative decisions as well, like when capturing a photograph like this, we decide, okay, we, I need to use a very, very fast shutter speed for this photograph to get this snowboarder in action, but I want to keep a nice deep of depth of field in the background there as well to make sure that you know we still get some sharpness in that stunning mountain landscape in the background too and these are the kind of decisions that you're going to make in a split second and it's going to allow you to develop a style and really push your photography to new levels like again you've got with this photograph here, we've got a very intense photograph here, a nice shallow depth of field here to really focus our attention on this athlete's eyes. We've got a fast use of shutter speed here as well to freeze uh, that water uh, that's coming off the nose there as well to create this really dramatic photograph. And it's only when you master a fully manual mode that you're going to be able to take your creativity and your technical ability to another level to be able to create and take photographs as stunning as this. So it is time to switch the dial to fully manual. And just a couple of things that we need to review uh, based on the last lesson. 
So if you didn't get a chance to see the last lesson, we had a look at the camera's light meter uh, and how we read light. And we spoke about stops of light. A very important key concept when it comes to getting the correct exposure in our photography. So I just want to do a quick review of that. And we're going to have a look at how that relates then to our shutter speeds and to our apertures. So... A stop in photography refers to a measurement of light. And as we saw, a stop is either doubling or halving the amount of light in your scene. So anytime we double the amount of light in the scene, we are increasing the amount of light uh, that gets to the camera's sensor by one stop. So anytime we double it, we increase it by one stop. Anytime we have the amount of light, we are decreasing it by one stop. So W amount of light, that's one stop extra. And anytime we decrease by a stop, we're decreasing the light by half. And let's have a look then at how this relates to our shutter speeds first of all. So if you think all the way back now to lesson number five, we had a look at our shutter speeds. And we had a look at our common shutter speeds. So hopefully you're a lot more familiar with these. And I say common and at the time, I did mention that there are other shutter speeds in between these shutter speeds, but there's a particular reason that we're not speaking about them just yet. But these are what I would refer to as our common shutter speeds. And as we saw as well, our slower shutter speeds will let in more light, they add more blur and more motion, um, and our faster shutter speeds, uh, less blur, less motion, because the shutter is open for less amount of time. But here is where things get very, very interesting. And here is why we have a look at just the common shutter speeds. For now, each one of these shutter speeds is one stop apart. So each one of these shutter speeds is one stop apart from the preceding or the previous shutter speed. So for example, 125th of a second if we were to look at that just for now if I was to go down to 160th of a second I am adding a stop more light that means I'm doubling the amount of light in the scene and it makes kind of sense here if we have a look at our shutter speeds because we're working with fractions here so 500 of a second for example a thousand of a second is half the amount of time it's half the amount of time compared to 500 of a second that means half the amount of light is coming in so each shutter speed is one stop apart from each other let's just take a, a cross section of that and examine it in more detail so as i just mentioned say for example i'm taking a photograph and it's at 500 of a second so it's at, it doesn't matter what it is i'm at 500 of a second and I decide that I need to add more light. I need to add a stop of light. Okay, the scene is a little bit too dark, maybe a 500 of a second. So I go to, go to 250th of a second. And 250th of a second is double the length of time. It's twice as long as 500 of a second. And that means we're doubling the amount of light that's coming into the scene. We are increasing the exposure by one stop. So anytime we double the, the amount of time, we increase the exposure by one stop of light, meaning double the amount of light is getting to the camera's sensor. Say I go the other way and I go to a thousand of a second. And as I mentioned, a thousand of a second is half the length of time. And that means we have a decrease of half a stop. So half the length of time means half the amount of light is coming into the camera's sensor. And that's a decrease of half a stop. Let's just make that visual to understand that a little bit more. So back to the wall. And we're taking a photograph. Our light meter is indicating minus a stop here. And we're at 500 of a second. So can you tell me, type into Morpheus please, what shutter speed should I change my shutter speed to to get the correct exposure here? So we're one stop underneath that means half the amount of light is getting to the scene that i need to correctly expose it what should by my new shutter speed be okay so type that into morpheus and if you said 250th of a second a big congratulations to you you're absolutely right so we increase the amount of time here we're doubling the amount of time by going 250th of a second that means we get the right amount of light for the scene our light meter moves to zero 
and it is now the correct exposure. Now, don't worry if you didn't get that right. We're going to be doing lots and lots of examples throughout this lesson uh, to really uh, get this down. Let's have a look then at apertures in relation to stops. So just a quick review of apertures. Um, if you want a full lesson on them, remember to go back to lesson number six. But apertures are expressed as F numbers are f stops so each lens will have a certain range of standard aperture sizes hopefully you're very familiar with that range on your own lenses at this stage you'll see it on the front of the lens it'll always display to you what the widest aperture that's available to you is and remember the lower the f stop or the lower number the wider the aperture is meaning more light let's just have a look at them again going from f 1.4 to f 22 now again, these are what I would call standard aperture sizes. Your lens may not go down as wide as f1.4 or f2.8, but these are the standard aperture sizes. There are more apertures in between each of these, but you're probably seeing where I'm gonna go with this now in just a moment. But just remember, if we want more light, we go down to our smaller aperture numbers this means we get much more light the aperture is open much wider we also get a shallow depth of field effect less light we make the aperture the f stop higher so we go up to f11 f16 f22 and this gives us a deeper or greater depth of field as well but here's something very interesting about these apertures each aperture is either twice the size or half the size of the one that is before or after it. So just like our shutter speeds, there is a relationship here as well. Each aperture is one stop apart. So the difference between f5.6 and f8, f5.6 is physically twice the size. The aperture opening is twice the size of f8. Now it might be difficult to kind of really see that here in this illustration, but that is what's happening when we are changing our apertures uh, by full stops. Either we're making it twice the size or half the size of the aperture before or after it. Let's just break this down a little bit more in detail, just like with our shutter speeds. So say for example, I'm taking a photograph, it's at f5.6, and I decide I need to add a stop of light. 5.6 really isn't giving me the amount of light that I need. So I go to f4 and light is increased by double. It's, decre it's increased by one stop because we now have the aperture open at twice the size of f5.6, meaning double the amount of light is coming in. Similarly to then, of course, if I go the other way and I go to f8, f8 is half the size of f5.6, meaning the light is reduced by half. I've decreased the exposure by one stop. Now, it's a little bit trickier to understand with apertures because, as I mentioned, with our shutter speeds, there's fractions there. So, you know, if you're, if you're decent with maths or math, uh, you should be able to kind of work that out a little bit easier. Our apertures, the numbers are a little bit more confusing, as we saw back in, in lesson number six. It's to do with the focal length and the aperture opening. Um, but each aperture is one stop apart. That's the key takeaway here. So let's put this into practice. We go back to the wall. And here we've got a very overexposed photograph. We're at two stops over in this case. And my exposure is at a f4. Two stops over at f4. There's too much light coming in. This is a bit of a trickier one, but what is the new aperture value that I should use? What aperture should I change my aperture to, to get the light meter back to zero to get the correct exposure? So remember, each aperture is one stop apart. It's a little bit of a trickier one. Don't worry again, as I said, if you're not too sure, we're gonna have lots, lots of examples later on. But to get the right um, exposure for this scene, I have to change by two stops, meaning I go from f4 to f5.6 to f8 so f4 to f5.6 then to f8 that's a two stop difference to get the correct exposure here to bring the light meter back to zero so our shutter speeds and our apertures the relationship between each of those shutter speeds and apertures is that they are one stop apart now we're going to have a look at putting 
our shutter speeds and our apertures together uh, to get correct exposure but the very first thing that we need to do when we are photographing in fully manual mode is to take a meter reading you need to know what you're adjusting before you can adjust it. You need to know how much light is available to you before you can start making decisions as to what you need to change. So you lightly press your shutter button, your light meter comes up, and you might see it's over or underexposed. So let's just have a look. So first of all, we know where our light meter is now. We're going to find it on the camera's LCD, or you might find it through the camera's viewfinder as well. And if I activate my light meter and I see it's at minus two, I know I'm two stops underexposed and I'm going to need to make an adjustment to bring that uh, back to zero. So I'll need to make a two stop adjustment, whether I'm making two stops adjustment with my apertures or a two stop adjustment with my shutter speeds or a combination of both, a one stop aperture adjustment and a one stop shutter speed to bring that back to zero. And it's the same with the rest of these. You might be lucky enough that you get the correct exposure with your current settings and the light meter is at zero. But you just need to be able to identify how many stops over or under uh, you need to make an adjustment to bring everything back to zero. And getting the correct exposure should be our primary, our priority really when it comes to taking our photographs. We can make creative decisions as well and we'll see how that comes into play too. But our primary goal is to get the correct exposure first of all. Now, just as a slight caveat to that, when you switch to manual mode, your settings are going to be whatever the last settings you used were. So there's no starting point as such. So for example, if you did a very long exposure in manual mode, the next time you go and switch on your camera, the settings are still going to be set for that long exposure. So you're going to have to make a significant adjustment to bring the light meter back into some type of range. So your light meter is always going to be at whatever the last settings were. So if you're trying this at home right now and you're finding the light meter is not changing, you're, you need to make a, a more of an adjustment. You need to keep adjusting it until you bring that light meter back into range. And especially if you're indoors, there's not going to be as much light available as you think. So you might need to um, make that shutter speed um, a little bit longer. You might need to open that aperture up a little bit wider to bring the light meter back to range. But let's have a look at some examples, some real life examples with fully manual mode. So let's start off with a landscape. So this is going to be a very interactive part of the lesson um, as we work out our exposures. So here we can see we're just going to be dealing with a uh, shutter speed for this example. So we've got our current shutter speed and aperture and we're photographing a landscape and it's it's a little bit underexposed. Now, I mean, subjectively, you might say it actually looks quite nice, but uh, we want to try and get the correct exposure. So we're at 250 of a second. I'm using a very deep depth of field here because I want to keep that um, sharpness throughout the entire photograph. So you know, we're at f22 and our current light meter reading is uh, minus a stop, minus one, minus a stop. So what should my, my new shutter speed be to get the correct exposure? So I'm going to bring up the shutter speeds here just, you know, in case you're not that familiar with them, um, you know, that you can see them here. So what should my, my new shutter speed be? I'm at 250th of a second. I need to add double the amount of light here to get the correct exposure. Okay, so I'll just give you a moment to type that into Morpheus. So if we add more light here, our new shutter speed is going to be 125th of a second. 125th of a second uh, to get the right exposure because remember, that is twice as long. We want to maintain our depth of field here. And we want to keep that deep depth of field. So creatively, I make that decision that I'm going to change the shutter speed. So that's an example of how we can adjust exposure while also in, in maintaining the integrity of our creative decision without compromising it. Let's have a look at another example. So here we've got an example um, of a high speed photograph. We're at 500 of a second and the image is overexposed by two stops. So now, very bright here. 
you know, we we haven't lost all the detail, but we're losing it in the highlights. You, you can see it's just gone in the highlights. So that's definitely something that you don't want to see. Um, it's a high speed shot, so we don't want to change my shutter speed. I want to keep that 500 of a second. So then I make a decision that I want to change my aperture settings. So two stops over exposed at f5.6. What is my new aperture going to be? So let's bring up our apertures there. So uh, you can have a look at them at the bottom. Uh, just so you can see. Uh, you can help just to visualize this. So we're at f5.6. I need to make a two stop adjustment to get the right amount of light here. So what is my new aperture setting going to be? Okay, so let's have a look and let's see what change we make and the correct answer is f11 So that is a two stop difference. So if I move to f from 5.6 to f8 That's one stop difference. I'm closing the aperture down by one stop So I need to go again and I bring it to f11 and this will allow me to um keep and maintain that fast shutter speed now of course it would have a, a little bit of an impact as well on the depth of field too it would increase that depth of field uh, but that's okay in this case there is some compromises that we simply have to make as photographers when it comes to our apertures and shutter speeds so let's have a look at an example where we're combining both both aperture and shutter speed so here's a little bit more of a complex photograph so i'm at a 30th of a second and i have an aperture of f 2.8 the photographs are maybe a little bit soft maybe that aperture is just uh, open a little bit too wide things are getting a little bit too soft now i've exaggerated it really here in this image just to to kind of exaggerate the effect to show you the effect it wouldn't really look like this in real life but just to give you an idea and you can see we're also two stops over exposed so we've got a bit of a trickier one here okay so i want to increase that depth of field a little bit and i'm also risking getting a, a little bit of camera shake here as well at a 30th of a second so i want to adjust my aperture and I want to adjust my shutter speed, so I want to increase the depth of field a little bit more. And I also want to make sure I'm not risking getting any camera shake. So what is the new adjustment going to be? So here's our apertures and our shutter speeds here at the top. So I'm at f2.8, I want to increase my depth of field. And I'm also at a 30th of a second, I want to avoid getting camera shake. So what is my new exposure settings? What are they going to be? It is a, a much tougher one, but these are exactly the kind of situations you are going to be faced with. We're making one change to our aperture and one change to our, our shutter speed. Um, some creative decisions here, but I'm also trying to bring back my exposure uh, to zero. So if you said that our new shutter speed should be a 60th of a second and our aperture setting should be f4, a big congratulations to you. Well done. This is definitely a tough situation, but we've made two adjustments here. We made a one stop adjustment to our shutter speed by uh, decreasing the amount of time by half by going up to a 60th of a second this helps me to avoid getting camera shake and i also increased the depth of field by closing down the aperture would also help me to adjust exposure as well and bring that image a little bit more into sharpness and then these are my new settings we changed both our shutter speed and our aperture here we were taking into consideration our creative uh, part of the photograph but also looking at the technical aspect by bringing things back to the correct exposure now that's definitely a more complicated situation but i do want you to think about this when you are photographing in fully manual there's going to be times when you're photographing where you're only going to adjust your shutter speed because you want to maintain your depth of field Vice versa, there's going to be times where you're photographing where you want to maintain your depth of field, so you only change your shutter speed. But there's going to be lots of times where you're going to have to change both. You're going to have to change your shutter speed and your aperture and try to find a balance between both of them to maintain the correct exposure, but also maintain the depth of field and your desired shutter speed as well and it's not easy it's not it's it can be very complex and this is the challenge of photography this is the challenge of fully manual mode it takes practice but it's ever so satisfying when you get it right now 
What about times where you're trying to maintain a certain aperture and a certain shutter speed and you can't, there's simply not enough light available or perhaps there's too much light. You need to use a particular aperture and shutter speed setting but you're not getting the right exposure. Well, what can you do in that situation? And that's where we introduce ISO. So primarily, when we're adjusting exposure, we should be looking at adjusting aperture and shutter speed as our first two options. If we cannot get the exposure based on that, then we introduce ISO. And I only introduce it at this stage for that reason. It is the tertiary part of our exposure triangle. So we've seen light with our apertures, time with our shutter speeds, and finally then sensitivity uh, to create our exposure. And sensitivity is our ISO. ISO controls how sensitive to light the camera's sensor is. Increasing the ISO means the camera sensor needs less light to get the correct exposure. And it should be the last consideration in exposure uh, and it should be always set to its lowest to begin with which is usually about 100 ISO and there is a particular reason for that which of course we'll look at now in just a moment I'm sure you're already aware of what that is but let's have a look at uh, ISO in some detail first of all one of the most frequent questions that get asked on the course along with some of the other ones we've gone through in the past is what does ISO mean and really, I should be saying ISO, not ISO. It's actually a word. And basically, ISO comes from, or ISO comes from the Greek word ISOS, meaning to equal. And it's used by the International Organization of Standards uh, to measure and define different and universal standards for objects, for systems. Uh, it's just an identifier. It's not an acronym. So it's not the International Standards of Organization, like I hear a lot of people say, because they're actually called the International organization of standards you can have a look at them online but basically these are numbers that are used to identify and determine certain standards so of not just camera sensors uh, but things like tires and um, things like um, uh, children's strollers all these variety of different things iso numbers are used for and that is actually where it comes from it's actually a word iso uh, but a lot of photographers, including myself, uh, tend to say um, ISO. But we don't really need to know what it means. We should be much more aware of what it does. And just like we had a look at our um, apertures and our shutter speeds, we have standard ISOs and the most frequent ISO numbers, the standard ones are 100, 200, 400, 800, 1600, 3200, 6400. Now, your cameras will go beyond that and again, you're going to see more numbers in between each of them. But we're dealing with our standard ISO numbers because just like our shutter speeds and our apertures, each ISO is one stop apart. So if I have 100 ISO and I need to double the amount of light in the scene, I can go to 200 ISO and that means I won't need to adjust my aperture or my shutter speed. Okay, so ISO is going to make your camera sensor more sensitive to light and that also means that you know you could use it for things like nighttime photography which it often is used for so if you're trying to get a lot of light in and the light is is very very low you're going to be using much higher isos like 1600 like 3200 but high ISOs are also used by sports photographers to maintain very fast shutter speeds as well. And certainly by wildlife photographers too. So if you want to really keep a very, very fast shutter speed, if you're using, say, a telephoto lens and you want to use 500 of a second, you're going to increase your ISO to help maintain your very fast shutter speeds. Let's have a look at some examples and indeed let's have a look at a snow border so here we've got all of our settings i have the iso range up here because you know we haven't really discussed them so uh, you wouldn't be that familiar with them but our settings here we're at 500 of a second we have f8 and i've got an iso of 100. now it's a little bit underexposed we're minus a stop okay but i want to maintain my shutter speed and my aperture settings here because I, I like that capturing that that intense action by freezing the action as much as i can but i also want to try and keep a little bit of deep depth of field here as well just to show that little bit of movement there in the background so i'm at 100 iso 
I can definitely change the ISO here to uh, add some more light. So what is my new ISO setting going to be? Okay, so the new ISO setting then is going to be 200. So we just increase it by one stop. So we add double the amount of light, we go up to 200. And you can see it here, you know, with ISO, again, there's a logic. It's just doubling each time or it's halving each time. So 100 to 200, that's doubling. Uh, 200 to 400, that's doubling the amount of light. But we can move the other way, 400 to 200, we're halving it. So it's a little bit easier to understand this in relation to stops. Let's have a look at another example of this. And it's probably something that we'll be using ISO much more frequently for. This is a tough photograph. We're photographing at night. We're trying to get a portrait and we don't want to use a flash in this instance. We want to just use the ambient light that's available to us. We're at a 60th of a second. Don't want to go any lower than that because I'm going to get camera shake. I have the aperture open as wide as I can at f2.8, uh, but the, it's still two stops underexposed. So the only option I have here is to change the ISO. What is my new ISO setting going to be? Okay, so we're at 200. We need to add two stops of more light. Type it into Morpheus there, what you think the new ISO setting is going to be. So we have to, ha we have to add four times as much light here. And the new setting then is we bump it all the way up to 800. We go to 800 ISO. That gives us our two stops, our four times more light. And indeed, then we get the correct exposure. We maintain our depth of field and our shutter speed. Um, but we then get the correct exposure here in the scene. Now, it does introduce something else, though. And can anybody tell me what it is? So it might be a little bit difficult to see it in this photograph, but definitely increasing the ISO has introduced something else into this photograph. You can see it definitely in the darker parts of the shot here. And... This is one of the reasons that we can't uh, rely on ISO all the time to get to change our exposure, and that's because of what is called noise. Every time we increase the ISO, we are introducing what is called noise. You can see it quite clearly here. Again, I've just exaggerated it a little bit here so we can identify it. But as we increase, we get this kind of texture effect in the photographs that's much more visible in darker photographs which is why it's more apparent at night in nighttime shots but it is actually also going to be visible in shadow areas um, in photographs as well and noise is caused uh, when we turn up the sensitivity of our camera sensor so as we increase the ISO we're increasing the sensitivity and that will reveal noise so what is noise well Noise is basically background interference. So when we increase it, we are increasing the sensitivity of our electronic sensors to light. Remember, it's our sensors, for as um, incredible as they are, they still work on basically um, electricity, on converting light into electricity that's then converted into a photograph. It's like a signal that is converted into a shot. And as we increase this sensitivity, as we increase this uh, signal, it's going to increase this background interference. And it's the exact same way if you're familiar with using a microphone, if you do any recording, like myself, um, you know, right now, when you increase a sound on a microphone, even if it's in a, an empty room with no sound, you will still pick up a hiss, this background hiss. And, and that's just basically interference. And it's the exact same way with our noise. When we increase the sensitivity, it's going to increase the, no the levels of noise. Now, just a, another thing to note as well, Noise and grain are not the same thing. I often hear photographers say, oh, there's a lot of grain now in that photograph when they're talking about a noisy photograph. They're not the same at all. Noise is a digital artifact. Noise is something that happens to digital cameras. It doesn't happen to film cameras. Film cameras used to use grain on film and still use grain on film. They use light-sensitive crystals. 
and for film to uh, be more receptive more sensitive in lower light situations those crystals had to be larger and um, so that's why you actually see them when you're using a high ISO film you're actually seeing the grain grain has no pattern to it and it's a physical thing noise is a digital artifact and has a pattern to it so noise is based on the pattern of our digital imaging sensors so you might think it's a little pedantic it probably is but you know there is a distinction there the two are not the same but i digress so coming back to the lesson we now know how to get the correct exposure in fully manual mode we know how to make our adjustments to our shutter speeds to our apertures and indeed to our iso now as well so big congratulations to you for reaching that fully manual mode but there's just one final thing then that you need to consider and you know we've taken the photograph but what happens to it next so what way is it saved on our camera so it's really important then to uh, think about what happens after we actually capture the shot so we need to start talking about our file formats and basically there's two primary formats for capturing our photographs and they are raw and jpeg there's lots of other different types of imaging files out there if you're familiar with graphic design or anything like that you'd be familiar with loads of different types but how we capture our photographs we capture them in raw or we capture them in jpeg and well what's the difference with them and what exactly are they so let's break it down first of all you need to know how to set your file type so if you're not familiar with this this is important you can set your file type through the image quality or the quality option in your camera it depends on again what type of camera you happen to be using i just use the canon and the nikon here because they are the two most popular types but it will vary slightly uh, depending on the camera that you're using so you can choose what file type and you can choose the resolution you wish to capture your photographs you can find this in the image quality or the quality section it is also possible to set your camera to capture both raw and jpeg at the same time and i actually i recommend that if you're considering getting into shooting in raw and you haven't shot it before it's a good idea to have those jpeg files there as well but just be aware you're going to take up more space on your memory card so let's just break this down a little bit more so let's just have a look at the quality settings here and exactly what it's telling us so the first thing is it's our current resolution so here we can see uh, this is just on the back of a canon but here we can see it says 18m that 18m is 18 megapixels so that means that this camera is 18 megapixels the 5184 by 3456 that is the amount of pixels by the length and the width of the photograph so you multiply them together to get your megapixels then beside that we have the amount of shots remaining on the card so we've got 188 photographs remaining left on this particular memory card below that we have our raw file sizes so we've got it currently set to its maximum here which is 18 megapixels but there is a medium raw and a small raw file here as well there's those two options too i would always recommend setting your files to their largest quality uh, unless you're really struggling for space on your memory card there's absolutely no reason you shouldn't be shooting at your maximum quality below that then we have our jpegs and this is broken down even more into large uh, two variations of large small and medium as well so there's loads and loads of different options there but again unless you need to save some space on your memory cards or you've got a specific purpose in mind you should just have everything set to its maximum resolution now be aware again of course this might vary slightly from camera to camera but they will always have some kind of variation of this of small medium and their maximum large file size if we have a look at it again just break it down here on the nikon you can see we've got our small medium large set here but we multiply pixels by pixels so here if we have a look at the large 6000 by 4000 we multiply 6000 by 4000 that gives us 24 megapixels so if you want to know what the maximum resolution of your imaging sensor is your image size is 
go into the image size or the image quality option and you will be able to see what the largest megapixel option is available to you more megapixels doesn't mean that you're going to get a better quality photograph it doesn't mean that the 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 quality overall image quality is going to be any better what it does mean though is that you can crop in a lot closer on the photograph it will pick up finer detail a lot better if you are setting it to its highest resolution but you could have a look at a an image from a 6 megapixel camera and a a 60 megapixel camera you know they could be shot on the same lens with the same exposure settings and it could be very difficult to tell which is which it's only when you start getting into the finer details when you get much closer into a photograph that you will see your megapixels have a big impact so which should you be photographing raw or jpeg or which one is the better one to use well there isn't a better as such they just have two different uses and the way that i always kind of break this down is well to to use the analogy of food okay so say for example i always get a lot of stick for this but say for example you're cooking a meal for your your loved one your significant other and you decide you've got kind of two options here you can go out you can buy all of the ingredients you can decide i'm going to make um you know i'm going to i'm going to get some fish i'm going to get get a nice piece of salmon going to do some rice with it as well and um, you know maybe do some avocado with it or something like that whatever you know you decide that you want to make and um, but you, you go out and you purchase all these raw ingredients so that you're going to uh, create this meal yourself you're going to get some spices maybe a little bit of salt a little bit of pepper might put a little bit of cumin on it there as well to add a little bit of spice to it too and um, but basically you're making this meal yourself you're getting the raw ingredients you're processing those ingredients to create something at the end of it or perhaps you're in a rush and you promised you were going to cook that night but you haven't got the time to do it so you go out and you buy a microwave meal okay now it could be a really nice microwave meal you know it could be something you know like this a nice indian or something like that but fundamentally the difference here is that the ingredients are already cooked you're simply reheating them now you can still add a little bit of salt and pepper to it for a little bit of flavor a little bit of taste but the fundamental ingredients are cooked you cannot uncook them as such you're kind of let like working with what you've been given already and this is the exact same when it comes to raw and jpeg a raw file is something that we need to work on to get the most out of it and in the long run we are going to be able to do a lot more with raw file than we can do with a jpeg but a jpeg is convenient it's fast and it's ready to use and that is the fundamental difference between the two of them so let's just break it down a little bit more so our jpeg characteristics it's a ready to go file so it's straight out of the camera you know we can use it we can send it off to people we can um you know print it if we need to it's designed to be opened in any viewer software so any t any preview software or any editing software a jpeg can be opened it's a universal photographic file and that's really kind of what it's used for it can be opened by anybody it's a smaller file size uh, compared to our raw files but that's because it's compressed basically some of the information in a jpeg file is compressed down and if you open a jpeg and you save it and you open it and you save it it can keeps compressing and eventually it's going to um disregard pixels you're going to lose information and the image will start to look a bit muddy a little bit flat and pixelated as well so it's not good for repeated editing or repeated use it's suitable for printing uh, a lot of places will print from a jpeg directly especially if you go to your local camera shop it's suitable for sharing because it's universal it's easy to open information is embedded into the file so there's certain things that are cooked into the file just like our microwave meal so if we apply sharpness settings noise reduction any effects or anything like that like monochrome within the camera they cannot be undone afterwards so they're cooked into the file we can't reduce that sharpness afterwards really effectively uh, the noise reduction might be uh, too much within the camera we can't undo that and perhaps we wanted a color version instead of a monochrome one but we had it set to monochrome it can't be undone either so that is something to be very aware of as well is certain changes cannot be undone with a jpeg file 
And if in case you're wondering, it is an acronym. It's Joint Photographic Expert Group. This is a group of uh, photographic experts that came together to create this standard file that could be opened up by anybody. Joint Photographic Expert Group. Let's have a look at our raw files in comparison. So a raw file is uncompressed. There's no embedded changes. The only thing that a raw file captures is your exposure. Any other settings that you have, like um, say for example, white balance settings or sharpness or noise reduction settings, they are not applied to the file. It's just a pure exposure. It's a larger file size. It carries a lot more information, uh, but that information is something that we can use and we will use at a later stage it's a proprietary raw file this means it's not universal it's not ready to use in the exact same way that your lenses um, on your camera are kind of they have to be the correct lens the correct mount same with your raw files each camera brand has their own version of a raw file so for example if you were working with a sony camera you cannot open a sony raw file in a canon software so they're not universal it needs to be processed it needs to be edited before we can work on it before it can be printed or it can be shared through any type of software so they require time they require a little bit of work but they're a lossless file they're really safe to work with because you can't overwrite your raw file it uh, might be a little bit difficult to understand but when we start working with them and editing them you can always undo the changes to a raw file you can always go back to its original state um, without uh, worrying or that you know, you're going to overwrite it and do something that cannot be undone it gets the maximum dynamic range from your camera sensor dynamic range we look at a lot more in detail in our um, third module we'll actually also speak about it a little bit in the next module as well but basically dynamic range is your camera's ability to be able to see bright parts and dark parts in, a, in an image at any one time and we get a little bit more leeway when we're using a raw file so we can bring back some details or we can uh, reveal some details if needs be um, um, you know using dynamic range and with jpegs not so much but with raw files we have a lot more room but because of this because there's no changes applied um you know out of the camera the files can look a little bit flat so you might compare a raw and a jpeg file and you might actually find that the raw file doesn't look as good but that's because we haven't done any work to it yet and it can be a little bit difficult to understand at the start so until you actually start using a raw file they, it can be a little bit strange to understand how they actually work and just finally a, a raw is not an acronym it doesn't stand for anything raw is the exact same as say a raw piece of meat a raw vegetable a raw piece of fish anything like that it's just simply a raw state raw is going to be your next big step now that we have mastered fully manual mode you want to start getting into photographing in raw because this is where you're going to be able to really accelerate your photography and indeed that's what we're going to be covering now well as we move on through our next modules so massive congratulations to all of you you have just completed module number one so well done on making it this far you guys are the ones that are showing that you're absolutely committed to learning everything about photography so do give yourself a round of applause there is still just one more step to complete module number one and that is to complete your module one assignment so you'll find this after the lesson in your assignments area can also order your e-cert on completion remember that this counts towards 25 percent of your overall qualification so do remember you complete module 2 module 3 module 4 each of these will have a module assignment that will add up to your entire qualification and qualifications are very very important um, and there's a huge amount of benefits to obtaining qualifications no matter what your own objective what your own career what your own goal is for this particular course 
Qualifications will open the door to even more qualifications. So perhaps this is the start of your journey and you're thinking about going on and studying something more. So obviously you want to complete the photography course first of all, but you may be checking out some other courses in the future. You might decide you want to move on into graphic design. Perhaps you want to go into a different area altogether using photography as a platform. But you can go on with your qualifications and obtain more qualifications and very often it's important that you actually have some experience um, you know for example with photography you might decide you want to go on and you want to get a degree in media this is going to be a huge benefit to you. Uh, having a qualification just allows you to expand your skill set as well, to um, you know hone your discipline, uh, to add more to your skills, add more to your CVs, to add more to your resumes. And this, of course, means that you've got broader career opportunities available to you. You can apply for jobs that you may not have been able to apply for before because you lacked the proper qualifications perhaps in your current career it's important that you get qualified to allow you to move up in your current company to allow you to progress to allow you to take that next step with your career and perhaps you've been you know after that promotion for a long time and getting the necessary qualification is the thing that has been holding you back and of course improving your career means that you've got a higher earning potential all of this comes from gaining a qualification there's so much value in gaining a qualification this is why people spend so much money on getting into college and put themselves in debt which they spend years and years and years most their lifetime trying to pay off and that's what we are trying to be the solution to 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 put you in a position where you don't have to invest huge amounts of money and putting yourself into debt and you are investing in yourself and hopefully down the line that investment will pay off and you'll end up making more money for yourself. And of course, perhaps you don't want any of those things from your qualification, but you simply want to feel empowered. I don't know about you, uh, but certainly after I had completed my degree and I had completed my master's, um, you know, the one thing that I felt was that I had absolutely achieved something huge i had done something that showed that i was committed to something that i could start something and see it the entire way through and i got a reward for that you know i got my qualifications and now i'm in this position where i am educating you and you know if you have no agenda to increase your earning potential to start a new career or to get a promotion there's still this huge sense of satisfaction and a accomplishment from completing a course and gaining a qualification and people just like you achieve with us every single day every single day somebody is wrapping up their course and gaining a qualification so why don't you join them you have made it this far you are far more likely to succeed so the amount of students that don't make it this far is huge so the fact that you are still here shows that you are committed and that you are the ones that are going to be successful going forward and to put it simply not to put a too fine a point of it you can't afford not to there's no good reason that you can give me for not moving on and progressing on and gaining your full qualification. But do remember that time is running out. This is the final lesson of module number one. Don't miss out on your chance. Don't miss out on your place to move on to module number two and to move on and complete the full professional diploma in photography. You know the story by now. Um, do take enough time to complete your course take out a six month or 12 month membership it's also much better value for you as well there is still 50 percent off for a very limited time lesson one module number two is your next lesson 
we have now mastered the basics on module one it's time to take that next step and to improve on your skills and students just like you just one for this lesson but a very very relevant one and one that i i really really felt showed the power of education and this from melody and she says she's loving her shaw academy experience she never had the opportunity the funds to do courses before until she discovered us she had she says herself she had actually lost hope until she was introduced to our online courses and you know one of the things that we want to do is what we want to change students lives we want to give students the opportunities that they weren't able to have because education was either too overpriced or they simply didn't have the time to do it either so this is an entirely new way for you to achieve your goals and as melody says it has given her the chance that she never thought that she would have which is a truly truly inspiring thing uh, for us here in Shaw Academy to show that our courses are having the impact that we hope that they would so remember for you we offer convenient flexible affordable interactive and internationally recognized education higher education at a lower cost you simply won't get this anywhere else it is our mission so remember to upgrade very very simple all you have to do is to click off the option that suits you best remember it's 50 percent off at the moment you can get 12 months education for the price of six you can get six months education for the price of three and so on and of course you always still have that option to go on a month by month basis if that is the option that best suits you but for the best value i strongly recommend that you check out that 12 month plan and continue with me to master your photography so the first lesson then in module number two is all about portrait photography so we're going to really dig in deeper now into these different areas in photography and the first thing we're going to have a look at is the different portrait styles so all the different portrait styles we can explore like fashion uh, beauty um, candid portraiture family portraiture studio uh, newborn photography we're really going to start looking at these areas when it comes to photographing people we'll have a look at equipment that you should be using to get better portraits so the different types of lenses and um, the, the effects that they have on um, portrait photography we'll also have a look at advanced portrait techniques like how to get bokeh in your photographs what the best settings are uh, to use and far far more than that there's so much that we're going to be covering in that first lesson in module two now i do have a lesson challenge for you of course as well and pretty straightforward one i want you to take a photograph in fully manual mode you might give us a little bit of an insight as well into your thinking into the changes that you decided to make to get that uh, particular photograph but i want you to take a photograph in fully manual mode remember to go back and review this lesson if you need a little bit of help in capturing that photograph or simply email us at uh, support at shawacademy.com so well done on completing uh, module number one module number one is now finished and we are now moving on to uh, module number two next week so i'll see you all very very soon for your next lesson so until then thank you so much for joining me and bye bye